point of century. So Socialism and that definitive referendum really unleashed or promoted a very strong debate within Venezuela um, and especially um, the, uh, how the reinterpretation of how people see the Venezuelan, ex the Venezuelan experience. Obviously, in Venezuela, has been a very strong political distribution. The extent, and I forgot to mention that in, in my caveat first, that, um, that I will not be able to talk here about the effectiveness of these policies. I can't discuss in the question and answer period, but that's, that's, that would be a very separate kind of discussion. Uh, Politics of redistribution, but especially also the, the, the return of the state as the main actor in the economy, a state control of natural resources, particularly oil, of course, as a number of novel social and economic policies, a revolutionary explosion of communal power, as, as some people call them, uh, but especially around the, the referendum of, 2000, of, of, of December of last year, uh, there was a very strong debate again within Chavismo itself, obviously from, from the critics as well, and, and most of these uh, quotes here are from people who were within Chavismo but have become increasingly critical of, 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 of the turn of events. For some, what the referendum that was without, uh, uh, and, and how the, what led to the referendum that didn't have much public, con much public consultation, uh, uh, reflects the return to the left of culture of the bureaucratic apparatus, there is, despite the fact that there's some very interesting dynamics, popular dynamics, especially at the level of community councils going on in Venezuela, especially in the poor neighborhoods of the large cities, nevertheless, and, and that's about promoting self-development and a different notion of development, especially endogenous development and a popular economy, especially through cooperatives. Despite all of that, uh, nevertheless, in the sphere of politics, and this is the, the, the third quote, from Margarita Lopez Maya, there appears to be a regressive evolution towards the closing of the space of participation of democratic decision making. So the question becomes that, I mean, will the state be able to open up to the more autonomous sectors of the transformation, especially of the social movements? And, and according to Edgardo Lander, which is also one of the main uh, people who are writing about this, he says only if the state and the government is able to open up to that more autonomous popular dynamics, the path towards a post-capitalist democratic society will actually start to take place. Okay, something very quick about Ecuador, and I'm sorry this is going to be uh, so quick, but I went to, to the uh, main uh, part of the presentation, which is the argument about modernity. Uh, Korea was elected in November 2006, very important since 1990, the indigenous uprisings in Ecuador, which have had a tremendous impact at so many different levels in social and political life and cultural life in the country. Uh, the Constituent Assembly was elected with a large majority of the party of the government. It is still, well, I'm sorry, yeah, it was supposed to end uh, in, on, at the end of June 2008. I don't remember, I don't know if anybody knows, it has actually was prolonged. There was a struggle around this, and a struggle around this, around the, uh, the, the, uh, the term for the Constituent Assembly to do its work. The president of the Assembly, Alberto Acosta, a very interesting and charismatic person to sign. The CONAIE, the Indigenous Confederation, has been very much opposed also to the attempts by Korea to close down the space of discussion about the Constituent Assembly. So right now, the, mo the moment also looks a little bit uh, confusing, to say the least. Uh, one thing that I wanted to highlight from Ecuador is, is the, that there's at least an attempt to bring about a new vision of development um, in, in the Constitution, in the Constitutional Assemblies. Uh, the national, the one of the uh, working spaces or working tables about the Constitution is precisely about the development model to be followed by the country. The Constitution itself is seen as a very important space for repoliticizing society and for bringing about what Correa calls Revolución Ciudadana or Citizens Revolution. And uh, there is, as I was saying, an attempt to bring about a new development model which is based on the notion of desarrollo humano, human development. We know that's not a revolutionary notion. We know that comes from mostly from the United Nations language. But nevertheless, in I think in this case of Ecuador, we have an interesting 
sort of hybrid attempt at creating a language that includes both the language of development, the more conventional language of development, but also a new way of thinking about development in terms of what is called Buen Vivir. And Buen Vivir, which is actually now enshrined to the new constitution as the goal of development. So the goal of development is to ensure that Buen Vivir, the well-being of the population, and the well-being of nature, for the first time in any national constitution, apparently, uh, the uh, nature is given rights within the constitution that has been a very uh, well sort of debated and discussed issue. But this idea, not only that nature has right, but also that the goal of development should be the well-being of the good, the well bringing about the well-being of the population, and that is, that is seen not only in terms of in, in, in economic terms, but also in terms of culture and respect for nature and so forth. Uh, I think that that's a very important uh, yeah, and among the tensions and contradictions uh, that are sort of uh, characterizing the, uh, what is happening in, in Ecuador, there's a very interesting debate about the role of academic knowledge in the government of Korea. Uh, Korea's cabinet, for instance, comes mostly from the academy and not from traditional political spaces, political parties. Uh, it is said that it doesn't really take seriously non-academic and especially indigenous knowledges, Afro-descendant knowledges and so forth. And that seems to obviously to be the case, uh, but only speaks about how difficult it is to consider, to welcome in these debates other kinds of knowing than the sort of established dominant forms of knowledge. That the new citizenship also just reflects mostly middle class models of citizenship, citizenship, liberal citizenship, even if a lot of uh, debate about interculturality in particular is also, has also taken place. And that despite the debate on interculturality, the, end, the, 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 the resulting notion of societal development continues to be very modernist. That has caused the pullout, especially of many indigenous groups, from the space of the constitution and being on the uh, opposition to the government. And so that we can say that, that as a conclusion, that's the last bullet point here, that in Ecuador, development has been descended up to a point by creating a space for culture, nature, and non-economic aspects of development. Uh, so in that sense, you could say that it moves towards post-development, and we'll see what post-development means in a little while, but remains still a very modernizing project. And now, very briefly, we move to the last case that I want to mention, which is the case of Bolivia. It's, in many ways, it's the most interesting case, the most difficult case, the case where the stakes are maybe most clear. Bolivia, again, uh, is, is the country where in Latin America that has the largest indigenous majority. I mean, it has a, a great majority of indigenous people by self-definition, I think about 65%. Uh, indigenous uprisings of tremendous importance in, in, over the last this decade around the water wars, the, uh, the, uh, the gas wars, the natural gas wars as well. Uh, these indigenous uprisings have positioned uh, especially Aymara uh, speaking groups in a very central place in many debates and many social movements. Uh, the, uh, uh, the result of this has was obviously the election of Evo Morales uh, with a large majority in uh, 2005 uh, and uh, the appointment of the uh, group to uh, write the new constitution. The new constitution was written. It was a process that was also written with tensions, contradictions, for many observers. The constitution, in a, in, in a way, involved a number of important mistakes by the government, trying to sort of incorporate and harmonize so many things that maybe couldn't be put together on the same table. But the draft of the constitution, nevertheless, was produced in December 2007. As most of you probably know, uh, that started the process of rioting in uh, the so-called uh, eastern region provinces of Bolivia uh, the, and the rise of a right opposition on the name of departmental autonomy, not on the name of a plurinational state, but on the name of departmental autonomy, um, the rise of these very elite-oriented groups who control the great part of the land and the territory, uh, asking for departmental autonomy and trying to undermine uh, in a very systematic fashion with the support of, of, of the U.S. Apparently, the process of building this 